Joshua chapter 6, Joshua chapter 7, I'm going to go through one thing real fast, and then we're going to go through something else on this real fast, and Sweetie Pie's not here, so I can preach to one if I want to, but I'll try not to, how's that? By the way, we still stream to our friends out in Kenya, so we are in a, um, Michael, do we know what village we're in this morning? Send it to me, so I read it right here on my Dick Tracy spy decoder watch. But anyway, turn around and look at that camera right there, and wave to all the people in Kenya, we love you. We thank God that you're with us. It's, it's nighttime over there. So they're out in the middle of a street in a village with a sheet and a projector. And they're watching our service with us this morning. And we thank God for that. Amen. 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 Judges chapter 6. You pray for me as I preach this morning. I didn't sleep last night. And uh, sometimes when I don't sleep, I get cranky. And when I get cranky while I'm preaching... Sometimes we have a good service, you know. But anyway, let's go, let's, uh, let's get on with the word this morning. Judges chapter 6, verse 36. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Verse 36, And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, you know this story. He said, I'll put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only... And it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. Verse 38, And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wring the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. So, what I want you to see is this, the first time he does this, he asked God for a sign, We've used this in our lives. We say, well, we're going to put a fleece out before the Lord. That's where that comes from. So the first time, he puts the fleece out, and what he wants is for... He's going to leave it out there all night, and he wants the fleece to be wet with dew and the ground to be dry. I mean, if he just said, I'm going to put the fleece out, and if the ground and the fleece is wet... That's not really a sign, is it? Because that's kind of what's supposed to happen. But he's asking for God to do what amounts to a mini miracle. Now, I want you to think about this. If God is able to do any miracle at all, he's able to do all of them. Ask, hey, that was a good amen you missed. We'll work on it. If, if God is able to put a bowl full of water into this sheep's fleece while the whole rest of the ground is dry, if God's able to do that, He's able to do anything. Is there anything that it can be said that God cannot do? Or do we really believe that with God some things are impossible? Maybe you've been up against that wall. And maybe you've kind of decided in your mind that maybe God can't do some things because God hasn't done what you've asked Him to do yet. But I don't want to be guilty of giving up on God because I wouldn't want Him guilty of giving up on me. Amen? So the first time around, the fleece is wet, the ground is dry. Now... Under normal circumstances, you could say, well, that would be sufficient because he asked God to do this thing and God did it. But I think Gideon, I know that he's got the Spirit of the Lord upon him because we read that earlier when he, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet. And he, he gathered together these five tribes together and he's ready to go to war with them. We know the Spirit of God is upon him, and so Gideon now is going to think Bible. Because the Spirit of the Lord is also the Word of the Lord, and you don't ever separate the two out. 
Because if the Holy Spirit's going to lead you, He's going to do it by the book. Somebody say amen. So, why then would Gideon want this thing to happen again? Did you ever think about that? Why he asked for it twice? It's actually real simple. Tell us, Brother Cooley, you already... Hey, listen, I already have this man come up and preach for me. Why? Out of the mouth of two witnesses shall... And Jody was going, I was going to say that. Losuk Village. L-O-S-U-K Village. So everybody say hello to everybody in Losuk Village. A place that you will probably never see... And people that you will never know this side of heaven. But I guarantee you when we get there, they're going to come and hug all of our necks. And we're going to hug their necks. And we're going to say, boy, aren't we glad that we follow Jesus. Amen. All right. Out of the mouth of two witnesses. So he's not satisfied with this yet. But he's about to be. So the next thing that he asked for is, see, that was verse 38. Verse 39, And Gideon said unto God, God, let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Ask yourself the question, does it bother God that you want to know for sure? No. Does it bother God when you question Him wanting to know for sure? No. No. Because God himself told us, test the spirits. Let me ask you a question. Do you think the devil is able to make a fleece wet with water and the ground dry? We know, we know, you alright back there Matthew? Alright, good deal. We know that the Antichrist, the false prophet, is going to be able to do lying signs and wonders. And you've got this crowd that's always looking for a sign. They're always looking for wonders. So Gideon does what I think God led him to do. And Gideon said, verse 39, God let it not thy anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once. With the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground, let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Now here's what I want you to think about. He asked for two witnesses to testify to him that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. And I want you to notice that these two witnesses were the Exact opposite of one another. Did you catch that? The first time, I want the fleece wet and the ground dry. God does exactly that. The second time, I want the fleece dry and the ground wet. And God does exactly that. And Gideon then knows this is of the Lord because it was opposite. Deuteronomy 7, I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. Deuteronomy 17, 6, at the mouth of two witnesses or three... Witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness shall he not be put to death. Deuteronomy 19.15 One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, and any sin that he sinneth not. Do you remember the witnesses that were witnessing against Jesus? Even though they brought up two witnesses, what was it about them? They did not agree with each other. That's, that's the difference between the King James and the NIV Bible. They do not agree with each other. You see, I like Jason because he's a King James man. Amen. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity, for any sin, and any sin that he sinneth. The mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. Uh, Deuteronomy 17, I already read that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 29, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. 2 Corinthians 13, 1, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. 1 Timothy 5, 19, against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two 
or three witnesses and the Bible is establishing to you do not be satisfied with just one testimony do not be satisfied with one witness if you're going to know something from God God will say it twice if he says it once he'll say it twice amen that's exactly how God is let's go to the Lord and you help me help me pray about this message father I pray Lord that you would just give me grace today father in the weakness of my mind the weakness of my flesh today father that you would be a blessing to these people Lord, they are in a long journey through life. And there's times, God, when we're not sure we're going to make it. We have trials. We have tribulations. We suffer persecutions. We suffer at the hands of the devil. We suffer at the hands of wicked people. We suffer at the hands of Jezebels. We suffer, God, here on this earth. And we sometimes, God, we're just, we're like Elijah. We just say, Lord, just take my life now and let it be gone. For I'm not better than my fathers. But God teaches your ways. teaches your will. Teach us, God, how you do things and how you are. Father, help us in everything that we do to know you better. To know you. To not just guess at something. That if, that if somebody asked us about the hope that we say we have. God, that we would be assured in our own minds, in our own hearts. That if our time came up and we were within minutes of going to stand before you in judgment, God, that we would know beyond any doubt that we're saved. God, that we would know that we have our sins forgiven. God, that we would, we would be rested and well assured and comforted by the scriptures, God, that our sins are forgiven, our transgressions have been hidden, They've been cast as far as the east is from the west. They've been blotted out by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we know beyond any doubt that we are, we know the future because we know we're going to heaven and we've never seen the place. Father, we thank you, Lord. We ask God that you give us hope this morning. Father, give us hope in the two witnesses of Gideon. That Father, where we have failed, you succeeded. Father, help us to see the beauty of your word and the beauty of the witnesses. That's going to teach us, God, that it's not us and it's not our might and it's not our power and it's not what we can do. It's what you have already done and will do. So God, teach us this lesson today, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. So I want you to notice that those two fleeces, they represent the two witnesses. And in your Bible, you have the two witnesses. I like in, in uh, the book of Revelation that the two witnesses there... You can guess as, about as good as I can about who they are. Yeah, make sure that camera gets on me. That's camera D, by the way. We've got, huh? We've got A and B and C, and now we're working on D. Does my tie look good? Oh, we'll have to, we'll have to charge it next time. We learn from our mistakes. John, I'm going to put you in charge of camera D. All right? We'll get it to work anyway, right? Amen. All right. Anyway, think about this. In the two fleeces that Gideon set out, one was one way, and then he decided to switch it up, and he said, well, let's try it and let it be another way. And I got to thinking about that. When you had the two witnesses in the Bible, think about, think about your life. Think about, your, think about you as a husband and a wife. Brother Edward, how you doing back there? Amen. Could it be said that you and your wife don't always see eye to eye on everything? Sometimes. Maybe I should ask her. I'll probably get a different answer. She might say, he's wrong more than he's right, but I just make him, let him think he's right. Amen? God, get, God knew what he was doing when he gave me my wife. She does not see things the way I see it. 
She does not think the way I think sometimes. And God has used her being contrary to me in the way I see things. God has used her to be a blessing to me to keep me out of situations where she said, I don't think you ought to get involved in that. I think you ought to watch that. We met a guy one time about, oh, it's probably been 10, 14 years ago, something like that. And man, I was all gung-ho about meeting him. She said, I don't like him. I said, oh, come on. You, you don't even know him. She said, I don't know. Just something about him I don't like. You know what? She was right. Turned out she was right. And God did not give me a bride who is a yes person to everything that I want to do. And sometimes her heart has been adamant about certain things and certain issues. And I may have gotten a little steamed over it, but I found out that God was using that to make me stop and think about some things I was doing. How many of you say amen to that? Maybe it's, maybe it's not at a marriage, or maybe it's just in, in relationships that you have. You have a friend, you have a brother or your sister, you have somebody in the church. I mean, you know, God made you, but God made you different. And sometimes, you know, you think, well, I don't know why they see it this way. And they're saying, I don't know why they see it this way. But God uses that. Let me give you my example here. We notice that these things were opposites. And I got to thinking about the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Think about the opposite of Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for the Bible says, For as an Adam, and he's talking about the Old Testament Adam, as an Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be what? Made alive. Th those two are opposite. We are from Adam in that we are born of the lineage and the line of Adam, which means that we have the same sins that Adam and Eve had in them. We inherited it from them. And we are Adam. And because we're Adam, we're destined to die. This is why my first birth will never get me into heaven. It takes a second witness, a second birth. Because now that I'm in Christ, I am alive. Somebody say amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Think about that. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Then he said the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. You know what that means? The first Adam, all he did was bring death to us. The last Adam is the one who gives us everlasting life. Genesis chapter 3. Look at this. Uh, let me put it up here on the screen like this. The opposite of Eve. The church, the bride, is the opposite of Eve, watch this. The eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made, look at that word, made themselves aprons. Let me ask you a question. Did God accept those aprons? Was God satisfied with those aprons? Was God saying, okay, I see that you have covered yourself up. Did God accept that? No, he did not. God saw that what they had done for themselves was insufficient. And so God came and he clothed Adam and Eve. Revelation 19. I like this. Turn there in your Bible. Turn to Revelation 19, 7. This, this King James Bible says it better than any other English Bible in the world. Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. Think about it. In the Old Testament, it was Adam who said, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. They died. But now, Ephesians chapter 5, Paul said, Behold, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning who? Christ and the church. So while you have Eve in the Old Testament, who finds herself unclothed, and she made for herself an apron, God saying that it was insufficient. Now in Revelation 19, we have the bride of Jesus Christ, and let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. Look at verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in what? 
Fine linen. That's far better than wearing a stupid fig leaf. Amen? Clean. Clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Who said no? Great catch. It is not our righteous deeds. We have none. The NIV says in this verse, the fine linen is the righteous deeds or the righteous acts of the saints. And that's a lie. We are not clothed upon by the new covenant. We're not clothed upon by our own righteousness. When a mason dies, they strap on that little lambskin apron and he's laying there in his casket, dead as a doorknob, but he's got his little lambskin apron on and the, and the Freemasons all say, now that is his, when God sees that, when the great architect of the universe sees that, God will accept him in because he knows that Mason has earned that apron because he's done good deeds. And it's a lie. It is not by works of righteousness alone which we have done. But by the righteousness of Christ, it is granted to us to be arrayed in God's righteousness, not our own. So there's your second witness right there. Your first witness tells you that you're unclean and undone before God. That's the whole purpose of the law, is it not? The whole purpose, the law does not make people righteous. There are speed limit signs all over the state of Missouri. That does not make people obey the speed limit. Just ask me sometime. The law does not make you righteous. The law makes you aware of your wickedness. The first witness will tell you you're lost and you're dying and you're going to hell. But the second witness, when he comes, he'll tell you that you can be saved. Somebody say amen. Here's the opposite of Eve's temptation. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. They blew it. They had access to everything in the garden. There was nothing withheld from them. And yet, the wicked nature, the depraved wicked nature of mankind is never, never satisfied. We are never satisfied with what we have. We always want something else, especially what we can't have. That's our depraved nature. The first witness will tell you that you cannot conquer sin in and of your flesh and in and of yourself. So here you have Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 verse 3. He's been starving for 40 days and 40 nights. And with the same three temptations. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Jesus succeeded where we failed. So maybe I kind of got this backwards. Maybe I should have showed that we blew it. In the Garden of Eden, because even though we had everything that we could want, we wanted that one thing that we couldn't have, and we failed and we sinned. And here is Jesus, who is in want of everything. He has no food. He's had no rest. He's been starving for 40 days. And yet the devil comes to him, and he's weak in his flesh, and he's hungered. And the devil offers him the temptations, and Jesus says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So where Eve and Adam failed, listen to this, where you fail, Christ will always succeed. How many sins did Jesus commit? How many sins did you commit? All of them. Jesus, the second witness, is the opposite of Moses, the first witness. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, Who servant of the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. 
Now let me stop right here. Did Moses lead God's people into Canaan land? Why? Unbelief. Moses failed. Moses led them to the promised land, but Moses can never lead you in to the promised land. Now, hear me out, Bethel Church, you folks online, you folks in Kenya. The reason why God did not allow Moses to lead the Israelites into the promised land, God is showing you that the way to eternal life will never be accomplished by keeping the law. I could probably ask the question this morning, and maybe, maybe we might get a couple hands raised. If I were to say, who here, being honest, would say, I think this week I've been pretty good. And I'm not positive, but I don't think I really broke any of the commandments this week. We might get, I, I, I bet, better not ask it. But you've had those weeks, have you not, where you, where you look back and you say, you know, it's not been bad this week. I've been pretty good this week. What's going to happen next week, John? <laughs> You're never, you are never, this side of heaven, going to fulfill the righteousness that is in the law. Never. You've already ruined it. By transgressing one time, because the Bible says, if a man offends the law in one point, he is guilty of all. So God... I mean, here he is, he's telling Moses, Moses, here's the rock again. I don't want you to strike the rock, I want you to speak to the rock. But Moses was mad. And guys, when we get mad, we don't want to talk about something, do we? We want to hit something. Yeah. Amen! Yeah. We want to throw stuff and make a loud, crashing sound and tear stuff up. And that's what Moses did. Moses was mad. God told him to speak to the rock, and he didn't do it. And he took the rod, and he beat the rock. And God said, Moses, I love you, but you are not leading my people into the promised land. And in that, God signifies to you this idea. You cannot, listen to me. You know what, I, I've, I've preached this so many times, but I think I need to keep preaching it. We didn't get saved by keeping the law and we're not staying saved by keeping the law because we still don't we are insufficient as Moses the first witness tells you you cannot keep the law and be righteous before God so Moses builds an earthly tabernacle and shows them the way to an earthly inheritance. But now, verse 6, hath he, meaning Christ, hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Not, as the Hebrew roots cult say, a renewed covenant, a better covenant. It's better because it has a better promise in that it gives us a eternal promised land to go to. Not Canaan land here, Canaan land there. And we have a better mediator than Moses because Moses died and was no longer the mediator. Even though Christ died, he's still the mediator. He's still interceding on behalf of you and sinners all over the world who want to go to God. They can still go through Jesus Christ because he's still there. Amen. Take it. Go ahead. Let it fly a little bit. It, it didn't hurt, did it? Nobody threw a rock at you. If you get a little happy about what God said, just clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. 
Amen. Hey, listen, I could be a stand up here beating everybody to death. I'm trying to give you hope. Amen. The first witness will tell you you failed. The second witness will tell you that Jesus never will. See, he's the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. And the promise is, since you can't attain righteousness by the works of the law, how about attaining righteousness by believing what God said? And isn't it easier to believe what God said than it is to try to keep the law and do it? It's the opposite of sealed. When something's sealed, it means you can't get to it. You get the munchies every now and then, and you just can't get that bag of potato chips opened. Right? Pop! Jeremiah 32. In fact, turn your Bible there. Jeremiah 32. That's the... Oh, I love this chapter. I love this chapter. Jeremiah 32. God wanted Israel to know, I'm angry with you, and I'm going to take your land away, but I'm only going to do it for a little while. When I get over being mad at you, I'm going to let you come back, and I want you to know that your house is still going to be your house, and that your vineyard is still going to be your vineyard, and your garden is still going to be your garden, and your front porch is still going to be your front porch, and I'm going to give it all back to you. So God had Jeremiah buy a portion of land that belonged to his first cousin. And he had the right to redeem it. So he buys it from his first cousin, his uncle's son. And he wrote it out. Watch this now. He had two copies of the deed. Two. Because two's better than this is why, fellas, it wouldn't hurt you to wear both a belt and a suspenders. <laughs> Two's better than one, amen? If one fall, the other one will hold him up, amen? <laughs> you ain't never heard that? That's one of my best jokes. <laughs> Two is better than one. The first one will tell you you're not going to make it. You're not going to get your land back. You're not going to get your inheritance back. Think of Naomi, who's lost her husband. Now she's lost both of her sons, and they've not raised up seed under their daddy. And now she thinks that her husband's inheritance is now forever lost. And then God sends a woman, a Gentile woman by the name of Ruth, who marries the kinsman redeemer, Boaz, he's Christ, and because of that, God is able to restore the inheritance back to Naomi, who is Israel. So, same story right here, Jeremiah 32, 10. I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witnesses. See, there it is right there, witnesses. And weighed him the money and the balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the long custom and that which was open. So watch this. You've got two copies. One of them is sealed up. It's like having your birth certificate and a copy of your birth certificate. The original one, you want it tucked away somewhere in case something happens to the first one. You'll need that in case like you ever run for president. I wasn't going to pass that one up. You'll need it. So it's wise to take one of them and seal it up. And the other one is going to be open. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the long custom and that which was open. And I gave the evidence of the purchase unto Barak, the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, and inside of all of Hanami, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. Now, I like showing you this, and, and maybe you've never seen me do this before, but I love this. I want to do it again just to have fun for me. The book of Daniel. Turn there. Turn to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter, let's make it 12. Last chapter. Daniel is the 27th book of the Old Testament. 
Now hold your place there and go to Revelation. Revelation is the 27th book of the New Testament. There's a double witness here. Because Daniel chapter 12 verse 4 says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Daniel is sealed. Which is why you ain't never figured out what the last few uh, chapters of the book of Daniel are talking about. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. I've studied it. I've read it. I've analyzed it. I've tore it apart. I've put it back together again. And I still don't get it. Meanwhile, I go to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. One of these is sealed, and the second witness is open. And the greater blessing comes out of the one that's open. Somebody say amen. See, that's that, that's that fleece. One was, it was dry, one, wet one day, and dry the next. Think about you. You were baptized. And you were wet. And God brought you back out. Now you're alive. Now you're dry again. Which is better? To be down in the water or to be out of the water? Amen. The second witness is the, going to be the opposite of bondage. Galatians 4.22 For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Ishmael and Isaac are going to testify before us today. They are the two witnesses. And Ishmael is going to say, I was born of Abraham, yes, but my mother was a slave, a bond slave woman, and I, being born of her, was born into bondage. That's your first birth. You're born once, you're born in bondage. You're born in bondage, Romans 7 says, the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. You are born in bondage to the desires and the lust and the pride of your wicked flesh. And oh, how we desire to be set free from that bondage. Can I hear God's people say amen? The one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman, but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. And God never breaks his promise. Amen, Gideon? Gideon says, Amen. I, he's living proof that what God said he'll do, God will do it. So Galatians chapter 4 verse 28 now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Now look at verse 29. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. I want everybody to turn around. I want you to look back at this guy, this ugly guy sitting on the back pew back here named Jason Cooley. Okay? This guy, I, he's one of my heroes. I'm not making this up. He's a street preacher. And he goes out and he stands on the street corners and the sodomites hate his guts. So do the lesbians and the witches and all of those wicked defiled, nasty, vile people. They've tried to start fights with him. All right? They've cursed him to his face. They've plotted against him. Am I right? Or am I just making this stuff up? Because every time I hear about what happened to you while you're street preaching, I'm going, God, please don't do that. That's not for me, God. But this man will tell you that those who are born after the flesh hate those who are born after the Spirit. So Jason, you're out there preaching. And overall, on any given night, do you have like 
tens and twenties and hundreds of people coming to get saved every time you're out there preaching? And I'm going to be honest, I used to think, I'm go, I, 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 I used to think, I don't think he's doing right, because that really, that's not, that's not getting people to Christ. That's not, that's not working. And the Holy Spirit smote me one day and said, Mike, number one, he's my servant. Mind your own business. Number two, he's telling those people what I told him to tell them, and no, they're not going to get saved, but when they come stand before me, I'm going to play the videotape back. Because when they start lying and saying that they never heard, I'm going to say, Jason Cooley told you. You see, Ezekiel's whole ministry, God told him, you're going to go people of your own language and your own kind, and more than likely, they're not going to listen to a word you say, and they're going to hate your guts. But Ezekiel, go do it anyway. And that's what he went and did. Now, church, let me wake you up to something. You're trying to be all friends with everybody that you know that's lost. I don't particularly have a problem with that. Except when you start compromising. Right. You need to understand that they who are born after the flesh are going to hate you at some point. When you decide that you're going to take a stand. And, you're not, and when, when the people at work invite you to the to queer wedding. You're not. And it's your first cousin. And now your aunt is hating your guts because your cousins are sodomites. And she wants you to go to the wedding and the family functions and you're saying, I'm not going to be part of that. The first witness will tell you, you don't belong with them anymore. The second witness will tell you, you've got far greater people to be a part of now. Amen. He, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. And I want to tell you something. You watch social media. Because the legalist, no matter what form they come in, they are all over Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and everything else. And when you start talking about how we're saved by grace, they, they despise you. They're going to try to destroy you. Because all they know is, well, we do worse. We don't do that. We do this. And God likes it when we do this. And they are so cocky and arrogant and proud, they're going to hell. Amen. And they're going to hate your guts. Because you said, no, we're saved by grace. Through faith. And that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. You're not, you don't belong there anymore. We are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And then, the opposite of the tabernacle. Haggai chapter 2, the glory of this latter house should be greater than of the former. Now, don't you think about it. Solomon built that temple, and they came and destroyed it. So then, they're going to build another one, right? Was that the house that Haggai was referring to? No. Absolutely not. It had no ark, had no candlestick, had no table of showbread. The glory of God was not there. And they ended up destroying that one in AD 70. The real tabernacle that he's referring to is us. See, aren't you glad that if they burn all of our churches down, we're still the church? That if we lose every church building in America... And they turn it into re-education centers or whatever they're going to do. That we're still the house of God. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. For we know, look at this, I'm going to let you go. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. That's the first witness. We have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heaven. That's your second witness. First witness to tell you they're destroying this tabernacle. Am, am I right? 
And you can pin it on whoever you, you can pin it on the chemtrails, you can pin it on the GMOs, you can pin it on the, the pharmaceutical companies, you can pin it on whoever. But the bottom line is, this house is being dissolved. Some days I'm just not in the mood to fight it anymore. Because I know the second witness tells me I have a house not made with hands. Eternal in the heavens. Somebody say amen. amen. Aren't you glad now that you got two witnesses? Amen. The first one, he's not going to tell you the good news. The second one will. The second one will. Will you believe it? Bow your head. I'm going to just open up the benches this morning. Maybe, um, maybe you've just been struggling a little bit. That first witness has got you down. Because you haven't been very good. And you're feeling the effects of the decay that sin brings to your life. Either sins of things you committed or sins of things that you omitted. Either way, it's sin. And maybe you'd just like to have a little talk with Jesus this morning and get that second witness in place that'll give you some hope back not to give up, not to quit, not to let go. And to quit, quit trying to think that your good deeds and your good works are bringing pleasure to God, but you've omitted faith. You put more trust in yourself than you trust God's Word. I've had a problem with that. If all of us preachers would be honest, we've all struggled with that. So maybe just in this quiet time, if you want to come, I'm going to open it up for you to come and pray. It always takes the first one to break the ice. There's the icebreakers. Okay, now we got the stream flowing down to the front. And you'd just like to come and sit and visit with Jesus this morning and tell him what he already knows. You didn't, you didn't do so good this week. And you need that second witness to help you get through this next week.